welcome to light on where we invite guests who introduce you to ideas concepts modalities that are magical and fascinating my guest today is an astrologer the calling him just an astrologer would be doing him a disfavor walter boyd is an astrologer reiki master energy healer intuitive astro numerologist and tarot reader but none of these were the reasons that i connected with walter I happened to see his light codes on Instagram and I used it for my frozen shoulder. I got an immediate relief literally within minutes. Did I just lose you? Wondering what light codes are? Let's find out in this episode. Please welcome Walter Boyd. Walter, I'm so looking forward to this conversation with you. Sheila, thank you so much for having me on your show, reaching out to the world. Thank you, thank you. You're most welcome, Walter. Walter, I want to kickstart this with astrology. Now, for mm -hmm. most of us in India, astrology is a very natural part of our lives. We consult the planets for births, deaths, weddings, to fix marriages, to break marriages, to mm. move in and out of houses, for job interviews, for pretty much everything the planets are consulted. And yeah. yet, there are a section of people who believe that the faraway planets cannot affect our lives at all. So why don't you take us through your view on this? I would like to start by saying that not everyone's going to follow astrology. Mm -hmm. Not everyone's going to follow the tarot. Not everyone's going to follow uh, the intuitive sciences. Uh, but what is crucial, I think, is that in all society, everyone is looking for empowerment whether they look at science for empowerment, for information to be empowered through, or they may look at it from a kind of practical information to actually then gain some kind of understanding as how they can move forward to enhance their life, to better their lives. Or others may actually consult the stars or the tarot. I think in all of this, the one common factor is humans are constantly looking for a level of empowerment. And for me, my fundamental belief is that the universe is always speaking to us. And it speaks to us in a language that we personally will understand. So for a scientist or for a seeker on the practical realms, they may find and gather information that speaks to them in a way that they can understand. For those of us who read the tea leaves or the tarot or the stars, we find that the, you know, the information that will allow us then to gather the right wisdom, the right choices to then move forward. And I think that's the, that's the crucial, crucial word, choice. That even though we are given these pieces of information, human free will must still come into play. Because if we become completely locked into a philosophy, then we become slaves to that philosophy. And so when I first started with my astrology, it was like that. Everything was astrology. Everything. I saw people meeting and I would say, oh, that would be that planet meeting that planet. Or I would say that interaction meets that interaction. But that can be very limiting because it takes away the free will of the individuals to really expand, to really see. I like to, my, the way I work these days is I work with a principle I call care. Through astrology and the other modalities that I work with, it starts off with connection. So we connect with who are you on your chart? What is, what is your birth chart that you're actually working with? And then once you've actually connected to it, you can then align. You can align with the specific truths that's within your chart. And then once you align, you can remember, you'll reconnect to the different skill sets or the challenges or the, the, the lessons that we are here to learn. And when we have those things in our hand, we become empowered. So connection, alignment, reconnection, re-remembering, and then empowerment. And for me, the, the, in all the skill sets, whatever you may call it, whether it be science, religion, uh, tarot, astrology, healing, my core desire is to bring about a remembrance 
that we are empowered beings, that we are able to create through choice or intelligent choice, the decisions that can actually bring us forward, keep us where we are or take us back. It's all our choice. So that's, that's the way I see it. How beautifully you put it. I, <laughs> I like the way you said that um, universe speaks to us in many languages and it is, it does. Yes. Depends on which language or which kind of language that we choose to choose. Absolutely. To. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think, I think what, what we really remember, I think uh, 2012 and beyond, we are learning to actually listen and listen through the heart. Mm. For so long, we've actually engaged with the universe, either through here, as in, you know, kind of head-based engagement, so scientific, intellectual, and whatever, or we engage it from the heart and below, but not actually with the heart. So kind yeah. of uh, hedonistic, uh, sensual, uh, kind of acquisition, acquisition, getting lots of wealth or whatever. You know, we, mm -hmm. we try and engage with the the world either through our heads or with our bodies yeah but i think where we are going is that we're learning the balance point which is the heart okay and as we learn to listen with our heart the messages from the universe become even more pronounced you know we talk to another person and it's not just our bias or our in you know the way we actually perceive the world we also start to open with the heart and see where is this person coming from? And because the heart allows us access to the body, the, the lower chakras, we are able to then intuit and also feel the gut instinct. What is this person actually feeling on a deeper level? And I think that's where society is actually going. Okay. Um, I remember when we spoke last time, you also had a very beautiful way of connecting with the heart. Where you showed yes. people who really don't know how to get it. Do you mind demonstrating it? I think the viewers would love that. Okay. I mean, I think the, the, the best way to start is to always remember, remember to find yourself in a place of balance. And we can do that by simply bringing our awareness. So when we breathe in, bring that awareness to the heart area. And then when we breathe out, gently feel whatever part of your body is touching the earth so it could be your feet that's touching the earth or it could be where you're sitting because that's an extension of the earth whatever is touching the solid ground so in breath to the heart and with the out breath through into the feet now when we are in that center you'll find that our presence will generally move from head to feet, head to feet, depending on what is required in the moment. And therefore, when we are meeting a challenging moment, we may need to actually have some level of intellect. How do I deal with this? How do I deal with this situation? Or we may need to actually have a kind of body awareness. How do I consciously support this individual? But what happens is because we are moving from the heart, we are doing that in a fluid way. We're not saying I've just got to work with it from a kind of head base because the books told me this is how it's done. This is how it's done. Or from a kind of body way. So let me just hug you because you're crying. Let me just hug you. But not everybody wants a hug. You know, so what happens is when we actually finding ourselves challenged, the best way to actually really get back to the heart, because when we're challenged, we, we tend to naturally gravitate to one of these senses, you know, to actually move back to the heart, literally tap 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 as you breathe and that will actually allow you because that touch sensation will allow the consciousness to maintain its presence around the heart around the heart so breathe in and breathe out breathe in and i can see you're also doing the breath work as we're speaking so that's good so you're maintaining heart presence and then breathe out. And what happens then is that we, if we can do this on a kind of conscious, uh, regular basis, we'll be meeting our world with our heartfelt presence, our light hearted, because I, I, I receive instructions, or let's just say I, I received guidance that the seat of our eternal presence is not here. 
This is where we remember what our part of the grand plan is all about. Where do I stand in the plan? The universe has a plan for the whole unfolding. And the way I fit in is through here. I am attempting, each of us are attempting to bring heaven into earth. But the true essence of our eternal being is here. So if we want to meet our world in, a, in an empowered, truly empowered and sovereign way, then we must work to clear all the beliefs, all the uh, restrictions that we have been taught through generations, through lines of you know, familiar lines, community, where we are taught to either exist here or, you know, oh, you're a woman, you have to exist here. Or you're a man, you've got to exist here. Or you're this, you've got to exist here. As we work to actually exist here, where the seat of our true divinity lies, then we meet each moment as sovereign divine beings. We meet each moment in the fullest capacity to be a blessing to ourselves, and to the world that we are meeting in each moment. Wow. I, I believe you also read your charts a little differently. You look at the soul behind the charts. Is that what you spoke to me? Yes, yes. I think, you know, when I first started astrology, next year will be 30 years. It was very much a kind of exploration of who am I speaking to? What's the person that I'm speaking to? And so I would break them down into the different components, your sun, your moon, your Mars, your Venus. But then I, as, as my journey progressed, as my journey deepened, I began to ask, but where is a true person? A person's not just your sun. The person's not just your moon. You know, they're, they're not just your Venus. Where is the true intelligence? Where is the true divine consciousness that sits within it? And so for me, my journey has really been about bringing that synthesis because it's, it's in the sun, but it's not of the sun. It's in the moon, it is not of the moon. It is in the Venus, but it's not in the Venus. It's in the chart, but it is not of the chart. And, and I received, I mean, after so many years of being uh, a very deep follower of astrology and practicing astrology, my guides uh, about three years ago said to me, don't make the mistake to assume that you are your chart. What you hold before you is the challenge that you as a sovereign spiritual being have come in to try and decipher and solve. You are so much more than your chart. So, so that was a bit of a shock. It's like, okay, so all this time I've built this, this idea that this is the identity of the individual. But I think what this is actually saying is that we as a collective are moving beyond the, the boundaries of our... We are no longer Walter. You are no longer Sheila. We are integrating bigger and bigger aspects of ourselves, the multidimensional aspects, the emotional aspects, the energetic, the spiritual aspects. All these are coming to the surface and are actually being integrated as being a fundamental and crucial aspect of our expression. So Walt is just one level. It's the level that allows me to engage with the world, just as Sheila is just one level that allows you to engage with your world. But the parts of you that are now being presenting or are presenting themselves to your world are almost standing by your side. You know, and the more we are able to sit within our heart, that part can come in because it's needed. And then when something else comes up, another part comes into the picture. And so we become truly fluid in our behavior, in our expression, which from a kind of traditional uh, behavior, societal uh, perspective is a little threatening because most people want to say, well, Walter, what are you? Are you this, 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 or this? People want to put you in boxes. But I think society is slowly coming out of its box. Society and people are slowly coming out into an awareness of the, the true spectrum 
of our identities and that the named individual is just one facet, is just one facet of the, of the being. And, um, so when you read your, uh, read the charts of the people, the, of the clients who come to you, are you able to see all these, uh, see all these patches or? You do. I mean, I think, you know, I think it's just like, uh, if I said to you, can you please try and do an analysis of the Mona Lisa? You know, so what happens is you look at the whole picture first, but then you, you take the small little pieces. Each small piece gives you, conveys an expression, conveys an, a level of information. So you pull those pieces together and then you bring them together. And what happens is you'll find that the combined collection of pieces will be even bigger than the central picture that you saw initially. So, you know, like you would actually just see a woman who's just sort of, are you, is she smiling or is she looking like she's thinking? You know, that level is surpassed because you're taking the different pieces and you're slowly allowing it to expand. And when you bring all those pieces together, the true sacredness is then found. It is almost always hiding behind in plain view. It's, it's like, like I say, the sacredness I see, I see in you. And it's hiding in plain view, but under a mask. You know, and it's like, if you break a person's personality down, what happens is you then see the different constructs, the different ways in which that divine being has decided to come into the world. But it is the coming together of the different components that creates a tapestry, a story, uh, you know, it's like, it's just like saying, I guess you could say, I, my analogy has always been, I can give you chocolate powder, uh, flour, eggs, and something. Some people will turn it into chocolate cake. Some people will actually turn it into, oh, I don't really want the eggs. I'll just stick to the chocolate. Another person says, well, actually, I don't want eggs or flour. Uh, I don't want chocolate or flour. I just want eggs. So, you know, and even then, you can have different variations. The free will aspect of the individual allows for that free, you know, the, 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 the variance in the expression. But the components, it's important to know what you have in your box. And from there, you can truly express who you truly are. That's the way I see it. I think it's, it's about in giving those that holding up a mirror, showing them what they are, reminding them of the divinity and the sacred divinity that they are and allowing them to really own it and blossom you know as an astrologer there's nothing more fulfilling than seeing someone actually oh, i get that i really get that i suddenly see that and you know sometimes we work with challenges that we think are a challenge but when we reframe it when we take it from a different perspective we see it as to how it builds to a skill and how that skill is linked to a goal, as an example, that then becomes truly empowering for the, the, the person who is receiving the reading. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> but uh, I've always found that um, when we speak to people about the sacred part that you have within them, the divinity that you have within them, there are some people who just freak out because they don't want to accept that they have the power. I, I think that's true. There is, there, is a, there is a level of concern, but you see, my journey, I've not always been ultra sensitive. Up till the age of, say, uh, up till about 2011, um, yeah, 2000, 2009, 2008, 2009, up to that time, I was born in 1970. So, you know, we're talking about uh, 38, 39. Up to that age, my engagement with reality was primarily from here you know how do you get that work done how do you sort it out it's like oh the chart says this so therefore you deliver it this way and there was a kind of i won't say robotic but there was a kind of strict regimented approach to the individual to the analysis of the individual to the analysis of the situations it was a very cut and dry cut and dry but then I had an experience where 
you know, I, I went through uh, a healing crisis with, not for myself, but I was journeying with a very loved one, a very dear loved one who was going through cancer. And through that journey, I picked up Reiki. I learned Reiki. I, you know, it was my way of finding ways to support his journey through this, this illness. But it was through Reiki that I feel the real locks to my emotionality came through. Uh, and so after Reiki, I then went to go on to do uh, a year in psychosynthesis, which is a kind of therapeutic model, but it actually engages and fully accepts the, the, uh, the presence of spirit, the, the presence of the divine. And for me, that was seminal because prior to that period, if you said to me, Walter, what are you feeling? I'll be like, I don't know. It's just like, what's in the room? This is all I see, you know? And then one particular day, we were literally in session with my, my fellow students. We were doing something about mindfulness and emotional mindfulness. And I would say it was like a curtain fell because 15 minutes before the session, before that exercise, I would have st still stuck to the idea, what are you talking about emotions? There is no emotions. But after that, it was like, I, it was like emotions are an extra layer of color in front of everything. Now, that awakening came with it a lot of healing work because it was not easy. Because I think what happens is when we are born very, very sensitive, when we are initially born, this is sort of lit up. It's glowing. We are innocent. We are living the moment. We are exploring the world. There's a kind of engagement with other people. No one tells us this is right, that's wrong. It's just beautiful. It's playful. Okay, so it's, it's uh, root chakra all the way to the heart. But then the world tells us that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's right, that's wrong. So all that becomes wounds and all the woundings. And, you know, it's not just about the world putting us into boxes. When we grow up, there is hurt. We do experience hurt. And because we are taught to experience or to deal with the hurt from a kind of intellectual process, oh, get over it. That doesn't hurt. Don't be silly. Don't be silly. What are you on about? Stop crying. Stop crying. So we push it down. Okay, we push it down. I'm not crying anymore. Another hurt. We push it down. We push it down, push it down, push it down. So we get energetically. And then one day we can't feel anymore. We can't feel anymore. And we're thinking, what is everyone so hyped up about? Get over it. It's not a big deal. Get over it. We become the people that have actually told us to get over it. But when the journey, and this is facilitators, as, as we hold that space to bring them back, journey back to the heart, part of that work will actually be about being very gentle as they explore the wounds that close the heart in the first place that stop them from actually really engaging with the world. And so as we support and as we guide them deeper and deeper, they go into their solar plexus. So the first part is like the rage. Oh my God, all this rage. How dare the world did do this to me for all this time? I've been numb, numb, numb. And then as that heals, we find our sovereignty, we find the ability to really stand strong in our will, to be assertive. And we go deeper into our sensuality, into the, into the inner child chakra. And then we actually have to actually learn to reparent ourselves. So where was I? So I'm saying that as we move into the sacral chakra, we then have to heal the emotional wounds the emotional wounds around intimacy, the emotional wounds around sharing, the emotional rules, wounds around being able to hold space with other people without feeling the infringement, but actually having that sense of innocence. And then once that is healed, we go into the root where we really stand as sovereign embodied beings. 
You know, once we're sovereign embodied beings, we can jump back to the heart and we can go back to the root, we can go back to the head, we can come back to the heart, and we can dance between the different chakras to truly meet our moment, to truly meet the moments where it being people in situations or challenges, we are fully meeting it through all the seven functions of our being. And then therefore we are truly empowered. Yes. So <laughs> when did your journey, you said you've been in, you started with astrology, which is like 30 years back, you said. Yes. So you were a what, you were a kid. When you started. Oh gosh, no, no, no. I was 21. I was 21 when I was, uh, when I started. I've always had an interest. I've always had an interest in the alternative pieces of information. I mean, I love science. Don't get me wrong. I was doing my degree in uh, chemistry, but I was rummaging through our bookshop and in the secondhand pile of books, there was a book on how to draw your own astrological chart. I was hooked. It was only a book that big. It's only that thick. It was suddenly I found something that was different. You know, it was totally different. And I think it runs in line with my own personal chart because, you know, I, I like the mysteries. I love digging deep. I love going uh, into that piece of information. So I picked it up. I ran with it. Literally, I was, I was absorbing information constantly. Uh, you know, I was, I had a, uh, my chemistry degree on one side, but on the other side, I was also like completely enthralled with astrology. I was astrology for eating, astrology for this or that. And literally everywhere I went, I'd be buying books and books and books on astrology, totally absorbed with the whole subject. But you were only 21. Most 21 year olds have got different priorities, right? Yes, I what, think so. What was that hook? What is a book? I think the thing that I'm trying to deliver to people was what I was seeking for myself. You know, I, I think the, the felt sense was that I really didn't know who I was looking at when I looked in the mirror. I was, yes, I knew I was good at some subjects. I was very uh, academic. I could pick things up. I could pull pieces of information through. But that was minor. I want to know who am I? Who am I? So with the astrology, there was this, the voice at the back of me, who are you, Walter? Who are you? Who are you? And so eventually I ordered for an astrological reading, a kind of report. And it was a breakthrough. It was a breakthrough. I remember it coming through the post and me reading. I, you know, I, I went to my room and literally read it. I broke down in sheer joy because I was seeing attributes that had either been dismissed as, you know, this is not very boyish behavior or this is not very appropriate behavior. You know, it's like you're too sensitive, you're too this, you're too that. And suddenly I was seeing explanations as to why there was that sensitivity why was that 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 seeking of deep deep information why are you so intense walter come on chill out a little bit and suddenly i saw where that intensity was coming from i was seeing where was the sensitivity coming from the intensity so in effect it had given me a mirror that i had been looking for for so long you know that they were friends that would say, Walter, you're this, or this is who we think you are. But nothing really sort of made me feel like I was being seen. And suddenly I was seeing me in my report. I think what this was actually doing was giving me a chance to define what was me, what was really, really intrinsically me, and what was adopted behavior. And therefore by me knowing where I started and where I end, I could release the adopted behavior and actually start engaging and really sort of owning who I was. And that's, that's basically what I want to deliver for other people, to give them that uh, awareness of who they are. Talking about delivering for other people, um, I know you do life codes. Yes. And this is something that I want to touch upon. First of all, 
what are light codes? We started the, the, uh, the journey quite nicely. We, we sort of preempted that quite nicely this, this afternoon by saying the universe is always speaking to us. Hmm. Uh, whether it be, uh, you know, whether it be like the planet sending information through or whatever, I feel that they are packets of information that are constantly streaming into our reality, constantly streaming into our reality. Uh, different people will actually have different, perhaps, perspectives on light codes. But the way I see, or the way my team, my guides have actually said to me, they, their words were, find the language of your heart and all the fragments of your soul shall return. So for me, light codes, my primary goal with light codes is to find the tune or find the words or find the codings that are relevant to the individual I'm working with so that the different aspects of themselves can come home and so that they can become whole again. Uh, you know, but I also feel that light codes, there are many levels of information that can be held. You know, so you've got light codes that are written, you've got light codes that are hand gestures, they are spoken, they are sung, they are, there's pieces of artwork. I do hand gestures, I sing, I speak, and I also do art with it. Um, but I think it's, it's definitely new technology because when I first started this, and it's only been like, like last year that it really came back to me. It only came back to me about last year. Um, it came back in the form of language. You see, when I was very, very young, I used to speak in a language, you know, this, I grew up in Brunei, uh, but I used to speak in this foreign tongue that I just thought I was play acting. I was, you know, I'd be talking to the air and like, uh, or I'd be speaking to the plants or whatever when no one was looking. And one particular day I was walking down our stairs, my, my mother's bedroom was next door and I thought I was all alone and I was yabbing 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 to the air thinking like you know i'm talking this language and someone shut the door the cupboard door and i knew someone had heard me and i made a promise then that i would never get caught again that promise has been in effect all the way till last year because last year i you know as part of my development i was channeling pieces of information that i would share on facebook every day and somewhere in 2018, July 2018 and onwards, I kept getting this message, find the language of the heart and all the aspects of the soul shall return. And I thought this was about some kind of nostalgic song from the 70s or the 80s. It wasn't. Because in January 2019, I was lying in bed. This is New Year's Day. I was lying in bed and suddenly I remembered I used to speak in a funny language. And so that began my journey of actually speaking into my pillow. I live on my own. I live on my own. But even then, that promise never to get caught was so strong that to even speak in my living room or in my bedroom or whatever, I was like, I don't want anyone to hear. So there was stuff that I had to clear. I had to clear that. And then with time, it flowed. And with that language, the hand gestures came uh, the attunement styles came, the characters and the drawings and the works that, that came along as well. So, um, so what do you do with these, with the light codes? The light codes, okay. Uh, I think they're all in service. I believe they're all to do with service or to do with activations. Okay. Uh, I've done some experiments with them, uh, with my partner, uh, Marcus. We've done collaborative work. We've done collaborative work with other people as well. But I see that light codes can be worked in two ways. An individual can come into my practice and say, okay, I need an activation of this sort. I would then do the light code or I would actually uh, start channeling those codes through and put them in particular parts of their chakras or their body or their fields. So that is client-based light codes. So the client calls forth, as in the client sets the intention, and based on the intention, the information then comes through, and I put that information through into the field, into the energy, and so forth. But there's the other sort, where I could be doing yoga, as an example. 
I'm doing the dragon pose or something and I'm getting like a flash in information, I got to do this picture. And then what I find when, when those images come through, they are so quick. Literally, it's like, uh, I'm going to share with you an image or later on I'll pass you some images that you can actually share with, the, with your audience. But one specific was the unity, uh, the unity sigil. Effectively, it came in a snap. It was literally, I was just doing halfway down into the dragon pose. I saw it splash in front of me and it disappeared and I saw all the writings. I had to literally bring my little book out, draw it very quickly and go back into my pose. And once I'd done, once the yoga was done, I would go into uh, my computer, create the image and try and replicate it and then share it. So I feel that's the second type of uh, light codes where we become the channel for the information that is seeking to find expression. So like the light code, which I had, which I'd seen on your Insta page and I, I had used it yes. for my pain. So yes. these light codes can be used for, uh, I know that it worked on my physical uh, mm -hmm. aspect. So yes. you can use it for physical, emotional. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I think you, if you, light codes appear to be something that's actually coming into the uh, collective consciousness more more profoundly lately you know i think if we look at say the last five years and you did a search for light codes it'd be very little if you did for the last two years suddenly there's a proliferation and now it's like almost everyone's doing light codes because i feel that light codes are individual they are effectively the language of this aspect here, the sovereign, divine, eternal being, you know, and it's attempting to express itself, whether it be in alignment with the grand plan that's connecting here to the, to the universe, or as it meets another human or situation, and it says, okay, this is, the, this is how my heart sings to the moment, you know, so, Yes, the, the, the codes can definitely be used to, uh, to work specific areas of life. Uh, I did another, uh, another experiment where I conducted it on my own, but what I did was I actually placed uh, an invitation on my Facebook page for, for a set number of people not to give me any information as to what they were attempting to resolve. All they had to do was to actually give me an, two numbers, one between one and 10, and a second between one and 12. And on the basis of that, I would allow myself to channel the piece of information and put it out there. They would then have to um, use that, uh, meditate on that for a few days, and then come back to me to see whether they saw any resolution or transformation or breakthrough in the situation that they were working with and the results were quite profound you know as they, they were very very profound it's, and you know even with the collaborative work that I was doing with Marcus where we had some people sending their photos and we would actually do light codes over their photos and then send those images back to them we receive amazing responses with regards to how they felt it brought forward an awareness of where they were going from that for, uh, moment onwards or to see a shift in their energies. All that was actually, you know, it was, in some sense, we have moved beyond the kind of strategic planning and we're going closer to a kind of playful approach to what this technology, and this is another thing that my team have actually said, we've got to stop calling it codes as just codes because you just think you're putting in codes. These things are facilitating transformation and anything that facilitates a kind of shift from one point to another is called technology. So they say, call it light technology. You know, you can call it light code technology, but it needs to be truly acknowledged as a function of transformation. And we are using it with our codes. Okay. You have spoken about your guides and your team. Yes. So who are, who are the beings? <laughs> <laughs> they are constant. Okay. Um, in a few years ago, 
uh, Dr. Emoto, you know, the, the Japanese yeah. doctor with the, the, the wisdom of water. Yes. He came into Southampton, that's where I'm located, Southampton in the UK. And there were multiple stalls. It was held in the, one of the, uh, in a location that was quite massive. So it was like a, a hall of some sort. And there were several stalls that accompanied the event. And one of these stalls was uh, a beautiful energy healer who created these galactic sprays. And one of the sprays was the Syrian spray. And I have always loved the Orion Belt and Sirius the Star. So when I saw that, I mean, you know, this is several years before this whole energetic emotional awareness was truly engaged or fully embedded. So I just thought, oh, let me just try that. Let me just try that. So, you know, I, I said to her, can I actually buy a bottle? She says, absolutely, here you go. I bought it. I checked the astrological chart to actually see what was the energy of this thing. You know, that's the way I used to work. It had a very strong connection between the sun and Uranus of individuality, uh, you know, sovereignty, and really stepping up into, you know, being an individual. So I started using it. And a few days later, I remember this, like, it was building up to this really intense energy. It was, for some reason, I was using it and I would feel like, oh my God, it's like, I can't breathe. It's, all these energies are really heavy. And it's like, I think what was happening is I was actually clearing. I was actually seeing. I was actually reaching out and actually clearing all that energy that I've been holding myself down with because that night felt like, I couldn't breathe and I really felt sick with all the energy changes. I went to bed early. And the next morning, I don't usually, I didn't see things in those days, yeah? I didn't see anything. I didn't, it was, I wasn't that kind of visual. I was more like it was in, uh, information in front of me. That's where the information would be on a piece of paper, on a note or whatever. And I was lying in bed. I woke up and I just turned around and there was these three beings three beings stood there and I as opposed to go freaking out and being like oh my god there's aliens in the room and it didn't look like aliens they just look like light people people who you know it's like you turn on the contrast or you turn on the light level on the camera so they just glowed okay. yes they didn't look human but they had a head long arms and you know extended body and long legs but they were quite tall and I said what are you doing here as opposed to screaming and losing my head. And they said, we're here to support you. We're your team. Your ground crew, we are on the ship. You're just the ground crew. So I was thinking like, okay. So, you know, I think so often we get this impression that we are doing service and they are like our, uh, the bosses telling us what to do next. They said, no, you are ground crew. We're the same team. We are the same team. So I said to them, you know, so the dialogue began and there's a lot of communication. And I said, so how long are you going to be here? Will you be here for the duration of this lifetime? They said, no, 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 we're here only. We're only here to expand your bandwidth. This is language I do not use. They say, we are here to expand your bandwidth after which a different team will replace us. And I said, what, what, what's with the uh, expansion of the bandwidth? You're here to, to channel the rainbow. So I have no idea what that means. I'm still working on that. I'm still working on that concept. Then maybe the rainbow is to do with the light codes, you know, the different colors of the codes and everything. So it, it yeah. might be that. Uh, even as I say that, they're shaking their head. No, 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 you're, you're, still, you're still too limited. <laughs> we need you to, you know, just sit back. You will expand. You will expand further. Uh, and you will actually understand what that uh, means specifically. But that's how they are. And, you know, I sense, my felt sense is there is a Syrian team, which they are, but I also link up with, say, the Ple Pleiadians, uh, the Lyrans, because I'm a Lyran starseed. Um, and that was, again, that's not because I did any research. I did a, um, a guided meditation to find my starseed origins. And it was literally done in the, in the hour of my lunch hour at work, okay? So I'm on the balcony out there and I'm sort of doing this meditation and this cat-like creature 
pounce onto my onto my bench and it's like purring and it's saying, you got to lighten up. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So what's the story? And I said, where are you from? He says, Lyra. Okay. I know I do my astrology, but Lyra is not actually one of the constellations that we work with, you know? So, uh, we did the whole meditation. I went back to work and just before the work started, I did a Google search. What is a Lyran star seed? Lo and behold, cat-like creatures. So that to me is confirmation because I wasn't looking for them. It was, you know, it was downloaded or whatever you want to call it, it was channeled. That information was then later verified by other pieces of information that was out there. So. For me, I have links to Lyra, and I also have links to Lumeria. Mm -hmm. uh, I, a lot of my work tends to revolve around water, healing of water, uh, healing the land, um, bringing a sense of the sacred, a remembrance of the sacred back to the feminine aspects. Because I feel that the fire and air tends to be more masculine, yeah? Whereas the water and the earth elements are more the feminine because they're more receptive, they're more sort of uh, enclosing, they, they, they nurture and support. So for me, a lot of, of, of my interest, a lot of my desire is to bring that sense of remembering back to the water and to the land. So when I went back to Brunei last year, I spent a lot of time going to the beaches or working with uh, the women there, you know, some friends, and, uh, uh, women friends there and doing healing work, uh, restoring that sense of sovereignty as women, that sense of sovereignty as a woman within the modern world uh, to find their place and stuff. But also there was to do with healing the land where there was a kind of a lack of um, communication between man and the land where we just build a plan, oh, bulldoze the land, do that, do that, dig a hole, turn it into something else. But when the old days, there would have been a, a respect as kind of an approaching the land. What is the land seeking here? What is good for the land here? What is good for the nature here, the environment? So there would have been a kind of collaborative exchange between humans and the land. And I think where I was called back, it was literally to act as a kind of, I'm sorry that we have been so blind. But at the same time, let me gift this to you as a way of remembering and honoring the sacredness that you are. You know, so that's, that's a lot of work that I do. I do love the water. I do love working with the land. Interesting. <laughs> Is it possible for you to, let's say, share a light code for the viewers who are watching this, which would, I don't know what, what but one of the codes that i had actually prepared for us uh, mm. earlier was a unity code and it's called the sovereign unity codes and activation and what i was actually guided or i what i was channeling through and i was doing the codes was that our team or our higher aspects because you know I, we could actually say that my team on the other side is just a higher aspect of me. Just like your teams will just be a higher aspect of yourself. And what they're saying is in the current state that the world is going through, we are being triggered to be polarized. So we're being triggered to just flip here or flip down into the, into the root, our security, our survival instinct, or we try and over intellectualize the process and we're basically moving back and forth. And the more we're doing that, it's a kind of creating agitation within the system. But what they were saying to me was, come back, come back, come back to your center. Come back to your center. Do what you can to come back to your center. Because what happens is when we are truly centered, then the true frequency of our identity begins to shine. Just as I said before, we come back here, that's the seat of our sovereign, uh, you know, eternal, sovereign, infinite self. When we are existing from here and we are dancing with our life, where we are literally moving back and forth, but always coming back to the heart, 
then our natural frequency is being expressed. But at the same time, the world is currently being flooded with these extra frequencies. And these extra frequencies are higher frequencies of that frequency that we hold. Yeah, so the thing is, as long as we hold our frequency, then those higher frequencies of ourselves can express themselves through. But if we are dissociated, then that incoming higher aspect of ourselves has nothing to channel itself through. So do the world a service by being true and centered in yourself. And again, it comes back to the heart exercise that we did. You know, if we actually work that and do that on a regular basis, we embed the natural position of our essence within the heart. And therefore, even though there may be challenges that we face in our daily life, we are meeting it from a way, from a level that is congruent to our truth, our authenticity, our sovereignty. And as we do that, we are doing service because we are then channeling through the higher octaves of our frequency naturally. We don't even have to think, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it right, I'm going to do it right. The fact that you are actually holding your true frequency, your higher octaves will come through. It is a given. It's not even, can you attune me to hold my higher octaves? No, you don't need to. Once you hold your true frequency, and that frequency is held within your heart field, your higher frequencies are naturally embedding into your circuits, into your environment, into the matrix that you live in. So yeah, that's, that's, that was the, the, channel, uh, the channel piece I, I'm going to share with you as an image. That's interesting. So, so the, the one way to channel all the higher frequencies which are coming in this thing, it's very simple. Just enter yourself in your heart. Is that what you're Absolutely. What you're Absolutely. Uh, as long as you work, as long as you work from your heart, you'll find that the, the, the messages, the codes, the technology will come through. As part mm -hmm. of uh, the workshop that Marcus and I do, what we do is we initially work to clear the chakras, clear the circuits, and then we bring into alignment, bring into alignment the remembering that we all have our own codes. We all have our own codes and to then embed the presence within the heart. And that when we are called to service, whether it be for a friend or we're you know, uh, doing light codes or we're singing light codes, we are then speaking it from the, sp the space of our empowerment, from the space of our true divinity. It'll be like God singing his blessings, his or her blessings into the world. And you know, that's, that's the way I see it. If we, if we as, as a collective, can really speak from this space, we'd be creating miracles. We'd be creating miracles. How beautiful. And that's a wonderful note to, <laughs> to end this conversation. Thank you very, very much for sharing your time, sharing your wisdom with the viewers. She, Sheila, <laughs> it has been an absolute pleasure. And, you know, I really hope that it brings true empowerment, true yeah. empowerment and remembering, remembering for each of your viewers, yes. because it's all about remembering who we truly are yes. and that we are sacred beings. Uh, who have come to bring our own brand of magic into this world. Yes, that's my favorite word, magic. That is Walter Boyd. And if you're curious to learn more about your horoscope, about your life codes, about your divine team, connect with him. And keep watching Light On.